So opening the meeting of the Roxbury Montpelier or Montpelier Roxbury School Board of Directors meeting September 20th, 2023 at 6.34 p.m. Uh, our first order of business is um, public comment. We have no one in the room. So if anyone um, on uh, the screen wants to give public comment, so we have at least one member of the public. Um, you can, well, since we have one member of the public, you can just come off mute and introduce yourself and give comment. I'm Dana Hope, and I have a student at UEF. I just lost you. I you consider updating yeah, the we'll back. If you want to, sorry, if you want to start again, we, we lost you for about 10 seconds. Okay, it's Dana Hope. And I have a student at UES, and I'd like the board to consider moving quickly to update the policy to reenact so that uh, recess time can go back to what it was before the change. Great. Thank you for weighing in. And uh, uh, I, I know that's the policy committee has that before it, so we'll. I think we'll be looking at that in the next meeting. So, so thank you. Um, that uh, concludes public comment. I don't see anyone else um, from the public online. Uh, so next uh, order of business is the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move the consent agenda. <clears throat> do you have a second? I second. Uh, Was there additional? Oh, thank you, Rhett. Yes. I move the consent agenda with the inclusion of the um, uh, not September 15th, 2023 warrants for payroll and accounts payable. Great. Do. Okay. Um, I second that. Great. Any discussion? Mia? I had just a couple of questions. Well, one question and one comment, Libby, on your um, superintendent report from this week. Um, you have a sentence in here, our professional learning communities are into their first cycle of units of instruction. Can you tell us what that means? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for letting me wonk out a little bit. And I apologize I'm not there. And thanks for allowing me the flexibility tonight. Um, yeah, there are professional learning communities. So there are groups of teachers who teach the same content. Um, and so it would be the first grade team or it would be the Algebra 1 team. Um, so they teach the same content in units of uh, instruction or instructional cycles are, of course, like a unit of instruction. So um, it could be... Um, letter recognition in kindergarten and you know like if it's a it's a unit of instruction that's around one theme um and they plan it together they plan they understand what the priority standards are they understand what the proficiency scales are for those priority standards and they uh design common formative assessments on the priority standards they do some teaching they give the common formatives they come back and analyze the data split the kids into who needs more work so that's where the timely system interviewing comes in who needs more time with one of the priority standards, come back, look at the data again, reteach again if necessary. So the units of instruction are typically six weeks long, six-ish weeks long. Um, so they are well into their first unit of instruction. Okay, thanks. Uh, that is very helpful. And then my comment is I'm just really thrilled to see the website updates. I know that this was a big, big lift. And uh, so big thanks to you, to Mike, Peggy Sue, Jess, and Anna, especially for maintaining all of that. I know I've, we've been hearing from parents for several years that they would like access to this information. And so I'm just really thrilled that it's out there and available to families. Um, and I know that it was a ton of work to make it happen. So I just first wanted to say thank you for making that happen. And um, since not too many people in our community probably read your superintendent's report. I was wondering if we could <laughs> also publicize that that's happening in this principal newsletters, if you hadn't already planned on doing that. 
certainly can do that. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's a great suggestion. Thanks for up. Now, and thanks for all the work on that. It's uh, <clears throat> that's a really well organized, easy to read, uh, with a lot of I think information people are are hungry for. Um, that was anything good. further? Thank Great, thank you. Anything further on the, the consent agenda items? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, next on to board business, uh, facilities committee update um, on the committee charge draft and the ad hoc committee request for applicants draft. Kristen, do you want to? Take it away. Yeah. So facilities and energy committee, which is Emma and I, uh, and then we also have Tim Favorite, who consistently comes to our committee meetings and contributes uh, incredible value and substance. And <clears throat> he's been uh, with us every step of the way. And, you know, essentially in the last month or so, we've really just been trying to break down the resolution that the board passed in the spring and kind of break it out into action items so that we can create accountability for ourselves to make sure that we are following through on uh, <clears throat> what we uh, what we promised in that in that resolution. So one of the <clears throat> really three of the big things that came out of the resolution is that um, we said that we would create an ad hoc committee of um, of community community members, students, um, experts, you know, from the from the energy sector to kind of come together and kind of serve as a, a guiding group to help us navigate some of these big things. Um, and those are are shown. The drafts are here. <clears throat> um, one to kind of come up with this committee that would then help us to develop um, a net zero evaluation tool, which essentially would serve the function to guide us as a district, you know, as we, you know, need to make facilities changes and upgrades. Um, and we've been working directly with Andrew, just, you know, really kind of providing like that compass of how we go about making decisions when it comes to um, our facilities and operations and fossil fuels usage. So um, the ad hoc committee, would be dedicated to um, to that effort, and then also to um, I'm blanking the uh, net zero evaluation tool and roadmap. Thank you, You're the decarbonization welcome. roadmap. Yeah. Um, so essentially, that is really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of um, you know how would we go about actually arriving at net zero, um, and I think we would also be looking to the ad hoc committee to advise us in terms of we do have this earmarked fifty thousand dollar part pot of money. Um, you know, there could be a role for us. You know, trying contracting with you know outside expertise um, to to help kind of get into some more of the technical aspects of, of getting to net zero so we'd be looking for their support on that um, and tonight we just wanted to get these in front of you all we weren't necessarily anticipating um, an approval um, tonight but just an opportunity to get feedback from everybody and take that into facilities and energy committee meeting that we have on Friday um, to incorporate the board's feedback um, and then ideally arrive at something that is um, a final draft and have before you at our next board meeting for, for approval. But if it's also just looking um, quite, you know, complete uh, as is, we could, we could consider a vote tonight. So taking all comments and feedback. Any comments or feedback? I, I gave a quick skim. It looks very good. I'd love to read it, I think, a little more closely. Yep. Um, but but it, it, a lot of good work and a lot of good thought into this. Yeah, and as far as the charge goes, um, that was something, you know, kind of structurally was modeled after um, the SRO committee charge. Um, Libby helped us to remember that if there's going to be a designated ad hoc committee, that it does need a charge that needs to be approved by the board. So um, I think that structure is, is complete, but um, that's kind of, that's where that came from. So, yeah, and I can appreciate if folks, you know, need a couple more weeks to dig in. I think we'd love to get some substantive feedback before moving ahead with it. Yeah, I mean, I would love a couple more weeks if it's not going to slow anything down. But. Or I would also say if you have time in the next 48 hours <laughs> and want to give us any feedback um, in advance of our meeting on Friday, yeah. that could be really mm -hmm. helpful because mm -hmm. then that could just be a, a focused working meeting for us. Yeah. 
It would yeah. be great, I think, to just email any feedback that you have, edits or revisions or additions, to Kristen. Yes. And then we can discuss it. Yep. <coughs> I, don't uh, have, I don't have any feedback. I had one question, which yep. is, um, but I, I think I know the answer, so I just wanted to confirm it. The, there's nothing in the charge or the description of what the roadmap might look like or uh, uh, to, that speaks to budget decisions. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that maybe the roadmap does include budget decisions, but that obviously the board, it would be, the roadmap would be like a recommendation to the board and the board would need to adopt the roadmap is how I was imagining the process yeah. would go. Yeah. Yeah. There is, the tool would help um, Andrew make decisions about replacing equipment uh -huh. and stuff like that. So that so it wouldn't, it's not necessarily like budget approval for the school board, right. at the school board level maybe, right. for the tool, but the tool would, that is another piece to it. Yep. That the tool is designed, will, in, in our imagination, it would be designed to help Andrew make decisions yep. when he's like at a crossroads of, mm -hmm. of to replace equipment. Great. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so at the high school, we have like, a student club like earth group that's yes. focused on sustainability and I was wondering if there would be opportunities for maybe student representatives from that club to join this meeting or conversation perhaps yeah we would love that okay. and um, I would say that the student <coughs> earth group is very much part of like the origin story of mm -hmm. the resolution and um, the board's uh, commitment to um, to net zero. They came and presented to the school board in March of 2021, I believe, and they had made a direct request of the board um, to adopt a net zero policy. This is not a policy; it's a resolution, so slightly different. But um, you know, I have met with them a couple times. They were also invited to um, all our, our work in kind of developing the resolution to review it to provide feedback. We had two members who actually came and attended. Um, kind of just like a round table feedback meeting um, that they came to and, and spoke with us and spoke directly to the resolution and, and improvements that they wanted to see in it. Um, and specifically listed in, I think in our resolution is that we would like for students um, to be involved, you know, in this work moving forward. So absolutely, and we would love it if you all, you know, could be messengers, um, you know, once we finalize the ad hoc um, committee like request for applicants, I would probably reach out, you know, to via Libby to Tom Sabo, who I think is probably the still the um, teacher advisor on that, and see if I could, you know, join a meeting and and talk it up and see if we could get some applicants. Yeah, so, yeah. Am, Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I'm actually a member of Earth Group, so Great. I wanted I wanted to say that we appreciate. The, I think I can speak at least a little bit on behalf of the yeah. group that we appreciate what you're doing, and we hope it continues to move at a good pace because, you know, obviously this. Is very urgent, and I will definitely bring this back to the club and make Great. sure that folks know that this is going on. Great, thank you. One thing we might want to consider, and this is that could be based on this feedback, is it says two students on in the proposed committee composition, yep. but perhaps we add another bullet point that's like two members of the MHS Earth Group, like in addition. Uh -huh. The other thing is, um, you know, all of these meetings will obviously be open meetings, so anyone is welcome to attend. Um, so we could just have, there could be like a rotating presence of somebody from the Earth Group to report back to the Earth Group on the progress being made. I think that would be great. Yeah. And I think that section, like in terms of composition, was, was one piece that we wanted to give some more focus to on Friday, yep. as I recall. If we don't, do we need to approve the charge in order for you to get the, the committee going? That's a process question. That was my understanding, but I don't know. I would look to folks with greater knowledge and who precede me. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to approve the charge. Okay. Yeah. okay. You can approve the charge and, and change like slight composition. I, don't th I think if it doesn't change the intent, then it's not a bit that big of a deal. Or give yourself a little wiggle room charge if you need it. I'm just right. thinking, do you need the approval tonight in order to get going, or could you wait until the next meeting? I personally don't have a ton of bandwidth in the next couple of weeks to, like, <laughs> make anything major happen. Right. 
I mean, it's always good to get the word out, like the yeah. sooner the better, just getting the word out into the community. But yeah. I think we're okay. I, I okay. agree. I Great. think the intent, would, though, would be to come back at our next meeting on the 4th and get, get approval on the charge and, and yeah. the um, ad hoc. Well, and I think approval with probably some minor changes is going to, so if, if you can, you know, if there's like outreach you need to do mm -hmm. with out making commitments, like you could probably start that. Okay. Okay, Awesome. I have a kind of embarrassingly basic question. Great. Um, are the, are the Montpelier schools owned by the city, the school buildings? No. Um, so is the city of Montpelier, um, do they have any role in energy transitions for those buildings or do they sort of cede it to the Montpelier school board? Uh, the UES is, well, Andrew might be able to answer it better than this. Yeah. Uh, UES is on district heat, but otherwise I think we're our I mean, own master. We have a contract with them for, it was a 20 year contract that we're about year 10, but we are our standalone. None, none of their decisions, you know, have any impact on what we do. Like, we have to make our own decisions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The city had, um, what was it called, a process by which they hired a consultant to do the, um, their net zero sort of yeah. planning. Right. Um, and so this, our uh, resolution is aligned with the goals of the city. So we sort of used that as, a, you know, it was a helpful starting point, the city's net, net zero goals. I forget what the plan is called. Do you remember, Kristen? I think it was net zero action plan. Yeah. Um, but I think in um, one of those documents, there's a, a kind of a rehashing of the history, sort of of how we arrived into this place. You know, one one uh, of those factors is working with the city. You know, the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, who um, Tim Favorite, who's been working with us, serves on that committee, um, and he's been coming before the board, kind of presenting data, presenting the report. So they've been like an important, um, I would say, instigator to um, to us. You know, taking this work on. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions too outside of this meeting if you want any more background. Yeah, I think I might do a little more homework and then I might have some more questions. Okay, great. Awesome. Further questions on that? Uh, there's one thing we should have put in the agenda which we did not. Um, I have a slide in a little letter which is, um, I want to welcome Jake to your first official <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Uh, um, I don't know if Mia talked to you about committees <coughs> at all, and we had to make a decision tonight, but we sort of got there. yeah, um, but we do have, uh, several committees, which, um, we all serve on about two, um, Seiji was on facilities, facilities and, and equity and equity, uh -huh. um, you might be a great candidate for finance. Um, so we, we, so basically the way committees work are, uh, we all serve on, on a couple, they have different charges. We have policy, which deals with the policy that we, you know, we use to govern and that you know, if we need new policies, the policy committee deals with that, it updates policies. Um, you know, it, it takes feedback on policy. We have the equity committee, which is a relatively new, well, actually not that new anymore, but um, is focused on the district's, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, and making sure that that's integrated into everything we do. Uh, we have finance, which um, the finance committee basically, when we get a lot of budgetary things, the board gets relatively high level budgetary um, information and the finance committee meets at the quarterly reports and they get like a much deeper dive and basically the, the role of that committee is to figure out if there's anything more detailed that should come to the board um, and not to volunteer you for that but I know you've got a, a background in, in budgets um, and uh, we have the superintendent evaluation committee, which works to put together the superintendent evaluation, which also comes to the board. Uh, and that's basically, we've got a, uh, a form that we use that, and then some processes that we, you know, we go to, 
to uh, we do a, use a survey of, of Libby's direct reports. Uh, we use some kind of you know environment surveys and just data on how the, the district's doing. Um, and then we use you know our own observations to, to do that. So that's another committee. Uh, we have the facilities, energy, and just facilities, energy, yeah. um, which uh, deals with the topics we just discussed and works with Andrew to um, kind of do a deeper dive on our facilities needs as well as our, our energy use and, and climate policy. Um, so no need to make a decision tonight. You can definitely negotiations. Wait. Oh, negotiations, uh, which, is, which is the most fun committee because um, you get to sit across from your, your uh, kids' teachers and, and argue about how much they're going to get paid. But uh, it's actually, <laughs> yes, um, no, it's actually, it's, um, we've had actually a lot of, of success with, and we have a really good relationship with our union, fortunately. Um, so uh, there are three unions. Um, so that's actually been, been pretty, uh, um, Pretty rewarding, but it, it, it can be time consuming and the outcomes are not always guaranteed. And that's that's a committee that is either inactive or very active, depending on where we are in negotiation cycles. <clears throat> okay. And I mean I was I was saying the first thing in jest, but it's it's you know, we don't agree on everything and sometimes it takes a while to agree on things. So um, you know, I, I, I definitely know that there have been people who've served on the committee who have not been super comfortable, you know, negotiating with their, their child's eighth grade teacher over, you know, the terms of their employment um, for good reason. So, um, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's a good committee, but it's, it, it can, it's, it, yeah, it, it can get contentious at times. Um, usually it isn't, but, yeah. And with the negotiations, the time commitment is sort can, of very concentrated during yes. a certain time, and then it like goes down to no meetings at all. And other committees meet, you know, every other week, yeah. and other committees or once meet a month monthly. Or, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so yeah. it's sort of like each committee has a, a different time commitment. I feel like we came up with a document. We had a document that sort of like outlined, or did we just? Talk about creating a document. I think we talked about creating a document and didn't do <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Um, I think there is a description of all the committees on the website. Yes. 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 So you can go but to the not website. Down to the time yeah. Right. Um, and and go through that and and there's there's like a paragraph or two and, and then you can look at some of the minutes if you want to get a feel for it. You can get a sense of time commitment looking at the agendas though yeah, about how regular. Yeah. Most each are. Committee meets. Most are relatively regular, as you know, Emma said. Um, I think committees do a good job of keeping to the allotted hour, hour and a half that's slated for most meetings. Uh, yeah, negotiations can be different. It can be uh, potentially very, you know, very intense. Um, you know, some of the meetings are, you know, oftentimes two or three hours. I once experienced a, a nine-hour negotiation, mediated negotiation. So. It's a little, it's a little less predictable, but you know, in a year like now, when we're not negotiating contracts, it's it's completely. When is the next inactive. round of negotiations? We're negotiating one contract this year. Oh yeah, we are negotiating one contract. We're negotiating with Ash Ministry. Yeah. And when um, does that start? I think it starts soon, doesn't it? It should start very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um. I forgot to mention, you know, we haven't had a time, to, a chance to really meet in depth, with, but um, Zach and Merrick did not serve official, in an official capacity on any of the committees, and mainly because it's a big ask of students who have so much homework to do. Yes, and <laughs> um, the, the meetings are often times during the school day. Yeah, but you are always <laughs> welcome to, you know, if there is one committee that you're like super enthusiastic about, you can just sort of be an honorary member of that committee and attend when you are able to. Yeah. And all the meetings are open and posted publicly, so you're welcome to hop into any meeting that you want to anytime. Well, what we, oh, sorry, what we did do with, with Zach and Merrick is there are a couple times the committees would, would ask, ask, yeah, it was, it was something where it was really, we felt it was extra important to get student input, so we you know, asked them to participate in a few meetings uh, and then try to schedule at times that worked for them. Yeah. Continue with that because I don't think I can commit to yeah. a committee. Yeah. 
And we can talk more about that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that was that Zach and Merrick, one of their goals for their county on the board was to improve a specific policy that they had heard a lot about from students. So they were fairly active on the policy committee, but not like super regular attendees, but they were working on a policy. So something like that. Can I ask what policy it was? It was the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, mm -hmm. and it was around curriculum. Okay. So there was, um, and I can fill you in more in yeah. more detail on what they, and give you dra hand over drafts of mm -hmm. stuff that they worked on. Yeah. Jim, did you bring this up because we have an agenda item to add from the superintendent evaluation committee? We could, we could do that too. We, well, we do. We I just do. For, oh, I yes. forgot to Sorry. mention it at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. I emailed it, but forgot to mention it. Okay. And add an, ad and an item as well. to board business, which is to launch the, the evaluation of the superintendent by showing everyone the newly updated evaluation. Okay, excellent. We don't have to do it right now, but sometime under this heading of board business. Uh, we might as well do it right now. Well, I think if we do facilities oh, report, do, then okay, Andrew can go home. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. Um, okay, let's do that, and then we can add superintendent. Um, yeah. So maybe next meeting, you know, give it some thought, and we can, because yeah. I think it'd be good to have some of the other members here so we can, if there's some switching that, that we can do, we can do that then. I'll just put in a good word that facilities could use extra help. Yes. Cause, right. Because Seiji was on that committee, and there's only the two of us right yeah. now. So that would be great if you were interested in joining that. Yeah. Andrew, thank you for being patient. Um, yeah, I'll make it quick. Um, so uh, Anna sent you, or I, I believe Anna sent you the updated report um, the other day. And um, what I will do is I'll just go over the kind of some of the highlights and give you folks a chance to read and go through it. One of the things that um, Anna and I had talked about, um, and one of the things Anna and I talked about was um, getting some pictures for the website and things of that nature, because some of the stuff is, on the face of it's pretty dry, but uh, when you actually see a picture of it, it can, it, uh, brings it to life so uh let me just let me give you a let's start with a quick update of where we are with regards to the specifically to the flood stuff before i go back too too far to the year uh but we are uh in the process all the boilers will be up and running um two of the three boilers will be all up and running and functioning uh as intended by the end of next week the third one we are waiting, still waiting for some parts, some insulation blankets and things like that, and that's not going to happen. That, that's not going to get here for another couple months. Uh, but the school only needs two to operate, so I'm not concerned that it's not going to, uh, we're not going to be able to make enough heat. We certainly will. Uh, if anyone's been by the high school recently, the uh, lawns are coming in uh, quite well this last week. They've really turned, you know, they really, they look, they look green again. Um, we are meeting with FEMA next week to go over what they have to offer us with regards to outside um, repairs. So that, that's in process. We have, um, I have met with uh, Doug O'Donnell, who is the VisBit, our insurance, um, I don't know if he's an adjuster, but uh, we've met with uh, VisBit to go over our property claims, basically all the stuff that was lost in the basement and the process for that, we're waiting for quotes on a couple of things from our furniture supplier, but as soon as we get that, we'll send it along. If we don't get it by Friday, we're gonna send the package along anyway on Friday. So that'll be good. Um, I know we've already put in a big, um, a big claim for some books and they've already approved that. So that's, that's moving forward. So that's in good shape. Um, we continually, we continue to have, um, the air monitored in the high school once a week we have it come down and, and, and consistently has been coming back that is there's 
you know, fundamentally you're, you know, you're testing for mold and there's more outside the building than there is inside the building. So that's good and it's only going to get better with regard when uh, we really start turning the heat on in a couple of weeks. Um, so we're we're in pretty good shape. Uh, a couple, like I say, the couple things we got to follow up on uh, really is is getting the paving sorted out. You know, we've got stay mat in there, so we're not. I'm not too concerned about it, but um, it's really a matter of coordination with the contractor when they've got a bigger project going on um, that we can sneak it in. Um, but that's. We're, we're, we're heading back. The, the next big piece that we'll have to do is we are technically, the school is technically, if you look at a floodplain map of Montpelier, the high school is this little island that sits in the floodplain because it's elevated up a little bit. Um, so by code, we do not technically have to move our electrical closet out of the basement, with the entrance out of the basement, whereas other, anybody else that is does by, by code in, in Montpelier and Barrie. Uh, we've met with the electrical contractor and we've got a really, luckily where we would put it is right above where it is now. So it may, whether we need to move it out of the basement or not, it technically might be easier to build it and then connect it versus trying to rebuild it in a spot where it already is. So uh, parts and pieces for that are months out anyway. So we got a little time to, to chew on that one and, and figure it out. Um, but otherwise, uh, we are in good shape. I'm meeting with, prior to the, prior to the flood, we actually had a, a, a plastic membrane underneath the gym and the auditorium, or the, the stage. And we had done that, Tom had, had uh, put that in many years ago, just because with the wood floors there, it was an extra layer of protection with regards to moisture. So we're actually meeting with a contractor on Friday to go poke around the basement and, and uh, look at getting that reinstalled again. Uh, whether we do the entire basement or not, that's still uh, to be determined. Um, adding another layer of something is never a good idea in my mind. But um, so other than that, it's, it's, it's moving along. Um, any questions that anybody has on any of that stuff? Just the flood stuff? Yeah, just. I think you answered it. I was going to ask if it made sense to move the electric stuff in any of our other buildings in Montpelier up a level, but probably not. No, electrical stuff is really expensive to move. It's shockingly expensive. Okay. Um, and there's plenty of, yeah, no, the water would have to get awfully high to affect yeah. Union and, and Main Street. Okay. So there's nothing there. I have a question. What's that? I have a question. Yeah. Um, how, do you know how close the water in the basement came to the panel? Oh, it, oh, it, it, it covered it. The panel. Okay. Oh, it did? Yeah. yeah. But it, it didn't disable it? it no, no, no. No, that's why uh, we, we, did, um, we did kill the power to the building for a week because it was underwater. But no, never shorted anything. You, you wouldn't have known it. Didn't, didn't, didn't turn off a light bulb. And is, is that just luck, or is it? No, electricity. The, the electricity doesn't really jump. It, the water is not a great conductor. It's a conductor, but it's not a great conductor. So it's not like touching two wires to stuff. You can. It's a dopey thing, but in model for for model boats and stuff, you break in engines by running them underwater. So you can run stuff electricity underwater. So why is FEMA so insistent that people raise their panels? Well, because what? Well, it's not FEMA. It's it's Montpelier and Barry. It's relative because. In the older buildings to go, luckily, when they put the addition on for the library and the science rooms, they put the big Frankenstein cutoff outside the building. In the older buildings, that stuff's down, so you actually do have to go into the water. I'm not saying it's a, I'm not saying it's a bad conductor. It's, I, I wouldn't want to stand in two feet of water and have to turn, pull a big lever to, to kill the power building. So in these old buildings, they were, um, most of those are still down in the basements and they're still in the water. But like I say, the high school, it's actually on the outside of the building. Okay. So, that, and that came about because like I say, in the addition, when they did it to the science and library edition, they put it on the outside. So somebody knew the flood was coming and- <laughs> No, no, we, no. No, it, we, no, we had to go out there and do it ourselves. After. Afterwards. Oh, okay. Afterwards. Hmm. Right. But yeah, it's, like I say, it's, 
you can run electricity underwater, but I wouldn't want to stand next to it underwater. It's still dangerous, but um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to work out the logistics on that one and, and see what makes sense. Um, yes, Kristen. Yeah, I had a question about um, meeting with FEMA. So what <coughs> might be in FEMA's purview and possibly be eligible for, and I assume uh, it's, it's funding for? for, for primarily for exterior work, for, for, the, for the replanting of the grass, uh -huh. out front, the parking lot, that's stuff outside the building. Uh -huh. It's stuff outside the building. Uh -huh. um, insurance really isn't gonna cover much outside the building. Okay. Um, they have it very specific that if you have damage on your site, uh, they in the beginning they were a little bit encouraging like well maybe we have something and then by the time they got done with it they were looking pulling out clauses saying oh damage due to flooding isn't covered uh -huh. so again we're fortunate that I don't want to say there wasn't much but it was manageable and so FEMA we'll see what they do we'll and see what they do and I, I don't I know the city or I understand the city is like FEMA covered Irene the baseball fields for Irene the dog river fields, but I don't think they're covering them this time around. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know. <clears throat> and will they cover like reimbursements? You know, so for work that has already been done, they could reimburse. Yeah. 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 And then also work that hasn't been done. Well, sounds. there really hasn't been any work that hasn't been done. We yeah. We did it. Yeah. We we had to get school going, so we did it. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. It's it's new for it's new for us. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll find out next week. Okay. Yes. How long was the basement underwater? Um, it at its height, and I, uh, I'm not gonna mess around with pictures, but it's, at its height, you saw that when it was the boilers about that deep in the boiler room. Um, by day two, so it was probably four feet on day one. By day two, it had gone down about a foot, another foot, and then they started pumping. It took another couple days to pump that out. But by Saturday, it was it was. They, they couldn't pump anymore, so. And the first two days of, of water that level just going naturally down was just draining out. Drained out, yeah. Okay. And what is the word on the softball field, like fixing? Softball field, when we talked with Chip our, at Diamond Tech, the, the consultant who helps us in the Mountaineers in U32, um, he said that the, the field itself got washed away, the clay got washed away, but he said that's a field that you can build it and use it right away. So like the baseball field, those infields. Um, now this is, in, the, in thinking about it, it's, it was the rush of the moment, but um, if we did a clay, you know, you can, you can install it and play on it the next day, where some other materials, you actually gotta let sit for a year or so. So he said, no, you can, you can wait on the, the softball field. We can do that in the spring before the season starts. So I said, all right, let's, let's wait on that. Mm -hmm. So we'll just, it was, he didn't have the capacity to take care of it. And, um, we knew we could wait and still get the season and not delay the season. So okay. that's why we held on that one. Um, I was wondering if you could go over, I'm not sure if this is somewhere in the documents, but if you could go over how the athletic fields are affected right now and if there are any teams that aren't able to play on their fields. No, uh, we were very fortunate in that the, so what, if you think of the site and the bridge, when the bridge uh, was overflowed, and it kind of the river and the building in the corner of the building by the um, the old mud lot and uh, the back side of the auditorium. The water was moving pretty good there. That's why the softball field got washed out because the water was moving pretty quick. This is my take on it. By the time it opened up again towards this, the, the um, field hockey field and the baseball, it wasn't moving nearly as fast. It was deep, but it wasn't moving fast. So the baseball field didn't lose any soil. Now, it's a different type of soil, but the, the, the covers on the mound and the batting uh, area, they didn't even move. Um, so really, most of the effect was right when it was really rushing over the, over the bridge and towards the monument in that corner by the, by the bike path. That's why there was so much silt and, and muck there on those fields. But by the time it got to the, the, the main game field, it really it moved a little bit of the track around, but we were able to repair that. So the, the game fields and, and, and Tom Allen and his crew and Chip Stevens, it was get out there, aerate it, aerate it, aerate it. So they went out and they punched holes in it every other day for about two weeks and it made all the difference in the world. 
because you could you could have seen after the flood that like there were grass, there was lawns. It was like, oh, it looks okay, it's still green. And then two weeks later, it was all dead because all that silt just so suffocated the roots. The roots. Hmm. And by those guys just going out there and aerating and aerating and aerating made all the difference in the world. So the, so the game field's in fine shape. It's in great shape. The uh, field hockey field's in good shape. It's great, it's as good a shape as it ever was. Um, the baseball field, again, the baseball field, we, Chip will come back in the spring and he will clean it up for the baseball season. He'll get the weeds out of it and all that. But unfortunately, we rebuilt the baseball field last year because it had a lot of organic material, so weeds grew in it and just looked terrible, and it was a pain in the neck to try to keep looking looking good and playable. So actually, a year ago, we had that all, we had four inches of it dug out and new material. That's all new, now filled with silt and organic material, and you saw it just turned to grass um, soon after the flood. So he'll get it in playable condition for the spring, and then next summer we're gonna have to dig that out. Have to. We're gonna want to because it's just going to be, it's going to look crummy if we don't. It's just going to be full of weeds all the time. Um, the practice field over by, kind of between the, field, the baseball field and the softball field, was okay. A few washouts, a few sinkholes, but we've got that together. So that's been usable as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as intended, the practice field. The mud lot actually is probably going to... Um, the mud lot field, which we kind of used as a practice field, we basically added a little topsoil and some grass seed a couple of years ago. That actually is probably going to be much better than it was before because it's all been rototilled. All it's actually got some more organic material. So this is where the organic material was actually a good thing. And and on the other side, the other the main practice field, same sort of condition that they went through. They rototilled it all. They actually, you can go out there and there's a marker where Chip has his grading equipment. He sets a mark and with lasers and magic and all that, his machine goes up and down and makes sure that's totally flat. So I think those two fields actually, as long as we stay off and we're probably not gonna be able to use those for another year, we really should give them another year to really grow. But once they get back, they're gonna be better than they were before. Um, middle school, now we've, so we have a little bit of the, the the practice field that like half of it that people can practice a little bit they can't fold so the middle school is practicing up at middle school soccer is practicing up at the college and we actually chipped in they've got an onion river soccer has an agreement with the college to use that field and so we actually had an agreement with onion river soccer to do that and because we knew we were going to do use it so much um we actually I don't know if I donated, but we contributed to um, maintenance on that field, knowing that it was really going to get used a lot. So um, Chip went up there and he did some work for Onion River, and we said, "Yeah, we'll because we'll, we're not going to the Dog River fields that we traditionally use for soccer. Those I don't know when those are going to get back." Um, so, so the sports arc, we were, we were fortunate. We were fortunate that that we've been able to accommodate everything. No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where we are at that piece. Throughout the district last year, uh, I would say that, that really the, the couple of the primary things that really stood out to me was how Tara and Mickey really came into their own in their buildings. Tara at the elementary school and Mickey at the, uh, Tara at the elementary school, Tara, Mickey at the uh, middle school. You know, they've got a year under their belt with those buildings, and they know them now, and um, they're very comfortable with them, and staffing, and, and organization, and uh, making the buildings really work. Um, they've, they've really stepped up, and that was one of the great things that, with the flood that was, when, the, when we lost the high school, you know, we, we had to move, and we had construction at the elementary school. Mickey picked up the slack. We moved meetings. We moved part two over there. We moved people over there to have that. And Mickey just picked up, did it. You know, was 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 able to accommodate that. Tara, with all the construction that was happening at Union, she was able to deal with that. And it really allowed Tom to just do what he needed to do at the high school. And and that was a great relief to um, to the effort. And and if without those guys in those schools, we'd be in much different shape. Um, so that, that's, they're doing exactly and they're working out exactly as, as Tom had intended 
and had visioned for those those folks taking over those schools. Um, with regards to sort of the, the bigger projects that we've taken on, um, we've started the ESSER three projects. Uh, the Little Gym at Union will be turned over to the the uh, the school on. We lost a little bit of time with regards to the flood. Uh, people just lives needing to take care of their own thing um, just slowed everybody down. But the the little gym at Union um, is going to be turned over to the school on Monday, and we'll have pictures. It looks great. We took. We took $40,000 worth of asbestos out of that room, gutted it right down to the concrete and, uh, and structure. I got pictures that, I'll, that will be, um, I think they're in the report, but we'll also put them on the website. Um, our asbestos contractor did an amazing amount of work over there over the course of two weeks, three weeks. Um, but new rubber sports floor or cushioned sports floor, basketball hoops, lighting looks great. Um, the auditorium, oh, <laughs> spelled respectfully, respectfully along, incorrectly. Um, the um, auditorium at the elementary school, again, we had that abated. They were taking off literally half inch slabs of asbestos that was underneath the tiles. It was used as like a leveler. So they were in there on their hands and knees for weeks in, uh, in late June. Uh, so that's all been abated out of there. The room is just about completed painting-wise. We're putting the seats back in. Uh, carpet will go down, and uh, those who have seen photographs of it, it looks amazing. It's beautiful. It really is as beautiful as we expected it to be. So I haven't, there's not, I haven't shared too many pictures because we're just a couple weeks away from really being able to, to show it off. One of the important things, again, a little thing, but important is uh, we probably have invested $20,000 in hardware, door hardware, at Union between the auditorium and the little gym. Anybody remembers in there, basically, it was a deep pull on the outside and a push on the inside and a little thumb turn. So you couldn't lock the door, or if you locked the door, you couldn't get out. There was not, it was, it was the locks from 1939. So we went through and did that on the little gym as well as the uh, auditorium so now you can actually lock the door from the, from the inside so no one can get in but if there's an emergency you a little kid can push the bar and everybody can get out so it's a little thing but um but an important thing over at main street uh we uh started the um we started the uh cafeteria project the first one of the main things was julie had a vision of re changing the circulation as you guys may, you guys both went to Main Street. So instead of going down the ramp now, you actually come in and there's a set of stairs that drops you straight into the cafeteria. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. So, and uh, so now people can come in, they can, and we flip the serving line so people can come in, get their food, go sit down and then come back out. And actually we created a hallway that allows them, because so now we have basically one one-way traffic instead of two-way traffic. And it's really changed the dynamic of the room. And, and Julie was spot on when she had that in her mind. Um, so that was done this year. Um, next year, we will tackle the kitchen and the finishes in the cafeteria. Uh, we also will start on the, uh, uh, the playground out there. I'll be honest, the cost of things, you know, we were asked to put numbers to these things back in, could have been 2020, maybe 21. Uh, so <coughs> the scope of probably the playground of the middle school is probably not going to be nearly as large as it was, but I think the improvements that we will make will make a big difference. So that, that first money spent will make a big difference over there. At the middle school, we also created a, we took the old wood shop and we created a guidance suite down there. So now what was the wood shop now has two private offices and a common area for, for the guidance, uh, the folks guidance, making a big difference over there. Um, the other, the other future ESSER project is the special ed suite over at Union, and we're still, you know, thinking about what that wants to be. All these projects have to be wrapped up by September of uh, next next year. So, um, 
once we figure out the finances of this summer, get a better handle on that, we'll know how much we have left to spend and uh, make the adjustments that way. Um, with regards to, and down here, uh, we, it sounds like a small thing, but it took over a year for playground equipment. Play, playground equipment is still the longest lead item in the economy because everybody with all this ESSER money said, let's get kids outside and let's build our playgrounds. And so it literally took us a year to get a new set of swing sets out here and installed at Roxbury. But we now have uh, accessible swings over here, ones for sort of a older kid that, you know, kind of straps, straps them in and allows them to, to be safe. And then a smaller, I'll call it a bucket one for a little kid um, that we've had installed out here. And finally, we're able to get the wood chips underneath it and all that. So, um, so that's a good improvement down here. With regards to next year, um, really the, the big project that I see with regards to just our continuing improvement, uh, we're going to do some work at the exterior of Union Elementary. At the top of the wall, uh, the parapet, there's decorative limestone. And the caulking up there has failed. And you can actually, if you go by Union, you can see it's efflorescent. You know, the salts are coming out of the brick because moisture is getting behind. So. And we actually had a couple pieces of stone fall this spring. The water got behind, freeze thaw, cracked it, and dropped. We weren't sure what it was. We didn't, a, a student reported it to, uh, to I don't know if it was Katie or, or Tara, but said, hey, something fell. I'm like, oh, okay. So we did have Alpine Restorations, who, who specializes in historic masonry. They actually had a lift over at Middlebury College, luckily. So they came over with a lift and tapped on everything and shook everything and made sure everything that was up there was solid. Um, what we will do this spring or this fall before the winter hits, we are gonna put up some safety barricades along the just the front portion of the building where that, that fancier dental work is so that um, through the winter, if there is anything that freezes and, and breaks, it, it's out of the way of the kids. And, but we do need to, um, we do need to have all the old caulk, which, of course, has asbestos in it. Uh, we have to have that abated, and then have um, uh, a masonry contractor come back through and recaulk all of that, basically the top of the building. But it'll be, and then there's an option to do a, a secondary. I don't think it's actually lead, but basically a, a protective T that they put into the caulk that protects it from the sunlight that basically makes the cock job gonna last 100 years kind of thing. It's an extra fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 to do that, but again, it's gonna double or triple the life of the cock. But that's, that's that one beyond the sort of other projects that we're doing. That's kind of has the biggest, I've got my eye on the, the biggest. And it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a big chunk of money, but you know, we're fortunate in that this sort of steady making improvements um, kind of falls within that, I think. I think it'll be, it'll fall within that. Um, that's kind of the, 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 you know, um, I'm not gonna bore you guys, uh, but I'll go through. You know, we, we also uh, spent, as always, more cameras, better quality cameras at all the schools. Um, at the middle school, one of the things that we did, which was really nice and it was ESSER money, was if anybody remembers the middle school, we had the, the rack that had all the, the, the server for the, the, the cameras was sitting right in the lobby and you bang your head. And we moved that to the basement. You know, it was a little thing, but it's gonna make, make a huge difference. Um, but I'll let you guys read the reports. Read the report. If you have any questions, if there's anything that you'd like to see more information, less information on, um, let me know and we'll get it in there. And like I say, uh, Anna and I have already talked about the idea of, of getting some more photos. And, and like I say, I think the auditorium and all that, you guys will be blown away by. It's, it's, it's really pretty. It's really pretty. Great. I think I have questions for Andrew. Yeah. Uh, I have a few. Thank you for the report, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so, you didn't mention windows. It's in the report, but you didn't mention though it, those are going to start next summer. Yeah, I think yes. I think we actually are in a position. Okay. Uh, you know, the the sort of 
COVID's over. This is over. The money is sitting there. We've got enough that I think we can we we sh we can start them. We should okay. start them. Um, some of this other stuff is is past us, and uh, we've like I said, Tara's got her feet under her over there, and Good. she's gone through a season. Actually, she's gone through two seasons of construction, yeah. so she's she's uh, she's well versed in this, so she'll be able to handle that. Yeah, it seems like a necessary improvement to both UES and MSMS yeah, for absolutely. you know the absolutely. Um, quality of life inside the classroom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, I did wonder. It's a lot of projects slated for next summer. Can we do all of those things in one summer? We have to. Okay. Well, inflation's on our side, so we don't have to do nearly as much as we planned on. Oh, meaning we can't spend as much. We, we can't <laughs> do as much as we want. Just to. had to do the math in reverse there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of roofs that it looked like we might need to start thinking about soon. Is that the kind of thing that would go into the capital plan, or should the board um, well, be thinking the about with, saving? The, the problem with going into the capital plan is it just bumps other things out of the capital. Okay. Plan. I, 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 we actually, I was, I'm less nervous about the roofs than I was last year. Okay. They actually have, we, the the one that was kind of a little bit of a concern was the high school. Uh -huh. But some of the problem areas we actually had fixed, I think, and they've been working well. Even with all this rain. Even with all this rain. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ex exactly. Okay. So, um, yeah, we got two months worth of rain over in the over over uh, you know during the flood and yeah, and it was dry. So that one is um, like I say, I was I'm I'm less concerned than I was, but they're they're big expense items. So right. I don't I we don't want to. I think, you know, I've got five, ten year, you know, projections out there that we should keep in our mind that the, those will need to be done at some point and it's better to do them become, before they become a real pain in the neck. Right, um, right. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, like, what's the point at which we as a board have to make that kind of budget decision? It's not this year, yeah. but it, it just seems like it would be good to anticipate that and not have it be like, oh, we have to make the decision this year. Right. Right? Right. I, I, that's, a a finan money. that's a finance and, and strategy decision. Okay. Um, then I just spend it. I don't plan it. <laughs> we do look to you for advice <laughs> in order to be able to make the financial yeah. and strategy decisions, yeah. though. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate Livia's literally shaking her head. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one final question. Thank you. Which is we're, we're about to do the... Um, process to survey our facilities and get input from the community and I just was wondering if any if you have any like how that would work you have a whole list of, of potential or future projects and if any of those you're like oh I don't know let's see how this plays out before doing I, any of these no I don't think so uh, you, this the, this study is and, it, and it's gonna when we get into that strategic and I don't want to Libby can speak more to that but you know, when we get consultants on board and we get people to help us with this process, they're going to guide us a lot more than, you know, they're they're going to clue us in and, and make and push us in directions and ask us questions about how those all fit. Right. You know, and I'm not and I'm not sure any one of these particular projects would change anybody's vision of, oh, we should move the high school because it's going to need a new roof. You know. Right. Kind of right. But would it be the kind of thing where we'd go, oh, actually, maybe we won't invest in new windows at MSMS. Oh. I don't know. That's, okay. th that's going to be one of the questions they're going to have is timeline. Yeah. What, is, okay. what, is, what is the timeline? And I guess we'll have done that process by the summer. So we'll have some sort of right. recommendation anyway. Right. Okay. Right. Thank I, you. One last piece. Uh, the, so the state of Vermont is did their facilities, facilities report for all the schools. The reports are supposed to be uh, released in October. That's where they had an actual outside consultant and walked through all of our buildings and Oh, how old are your windows? How old are right. your boilers? And, and um, they are still. I don't think they're. I don't think they're going to release. Uh, I know they're not going to release all 380 odd schools or however many schools there are all at, in October. I think the plan is they're going to release them as they become complete and um, and move them forward. Um, I talked with Marty Spalding, um, who's helping, the, who's working with the state on that, and. Uh, he said we'll probably know in a few weeks like where we stand with everybody and so we'll have a, a piece of that so okay. it's really kind of a it's 
it actually where my report doesn't really speak to numbers this actually will speak to numbers uh -huh. it'll say oh you're gonna your boiler's 10 years old you're gonna need no one in 10 years and they cost x amount of dollars i would take those reports with a grain of salt because the gentleman who came to our building really nice guy smart guy he, but he's from minnesota and he doesn't know what the cost of a project happens when you got to remove forty thousand dollars worth of asbestos to get to that uh, pipe to replace uh -huh. you know and so it'll be a great it'll be a great tool and it's going to be a the 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 results actually going to be posted on a state website that actually is going to be kind of a living document so you can adjust things and change things so it'll be interesting it'll be it'll it'll be a good tool it'll be a good tool good. and it'll be at least give us some guidance thank but you that that'll be coming for them. Oh. um <clears throat> So I think a lot of the projects that are planned uh, in the next few years are not maybe going to like spark a lot of public interest, <laughs> um, but and, and just seem like it's like routine maintenance um, mostly. And some of it, it doesn't really make sense to solicit a lot of feedback, like a cafeteria. I feel like that should those decisions should be made by the people that work in that space and understand it best. But something like the, um, I've been hearing a lot of feed, like excitement and anticipation around the middle school playground. And I'm wondering if the facilities committee might be able to help, like if, if you want to solicit uh, public <coughs> input on anything. Well, I know Julie has talked about the idea of when we figure out what, where we are and what we can do, that you know, inviting the kids to be part of the conversation, maybe not help necessarily design it, but give their input kind of thing. So I think there's definitely, Julie has definitely um, has talked about that, um, but no, absolutely. The, and and the the building and facilities group, uh, I think we will get to where we've been sort of between net zero and floods and things like that. I think once we get past that hurdle, that'll be great. To that's exactly the intent of that. Of hey, this is what we've got. What do you guys think? And you know. Mm -hmm given our options and what's ahead of us, what do we think we prioritize and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's a good, we're, we're almost there. Do you have a rough idea of what the budget is for that particular project or has it, Which one? the playground? You said it sort of shifted. Oh, uh, well, what we, well what, the way we looked at it, the way I looked at it was, um, I wanted to do, because construction was still up in the air, I said, let's pick the easy ones, the ones that have the least unknowns to get those kind of out of the way. And the ones that, because the, the playground has, the, it's going to be the most expensive, like for what you get, because just earthwork is expensive. And again, I thought it was a project that if we, if you imagine that playground with that old crummy retaining wall gone and a nice new retaining wall with some seating areas and a couple of trees and a few benches, be a huge improvement, you know, like a little bit of, the return on, on investment's gonna be really high with, in that playground. And a lot of the other stuff, like a swing set or a different piece of play equipment or whatever, we can, we can keep adding that to it. So um, it kind of by, by design was left because it, the investment was gonna have great reward, but we had a lot of flexibility. Like we, we start to tear apart the special ed suite, we kind of got to finish it. You know, we can't just say, oh, we'll put those doors on later. Like we got to put the doors on. Whereas the playground, we can say, all right, let's do the retaining wall. Let's do some seating. And next year in the budget, maybe we put a, we put a new apparatus or something. So like just to manage expectations, because I was like, I don't know when people come to me and talk to me about it. I'm like, I don't really know what's planned. I haven't heard much about it. But to manage expectations around that, it's, it's not like going to be a bunch of fun playground equipment. It's more about earth movement and yeah, retaining walls yeah. and stuff and, like and, that. And social things. It's going to be more social things and, and way kids can interact with each other than there are than it is play equipment. You know, because the older kids don't really need the play equipment; they need social spaces. I feel like that can also help with like accessibility. For some, not everyone can use some of the equipment that's on the playground, but they can still be included yeah. in conversations and having fun. Yeah. One of the things that we did do over there that um, worked out really well is the, we put the Gaga pit in the gazebo. Oh. 
and because uh, the Gaga pits are really enjoyed by everybody, but once the snow comes and they get filled with water and ice and all this, then uh, and the the gazebo with its table in there was a was a um, was a, its own social club after hours, and so uh, the idea was, well, why don't we take the table out and put it in there, see how it works, and it fit perfectly, and now people can play. Um, with the Gaga pit, even when it's raining out, and it seems to have worked well. So, That's great. okay, um, we had two more questions. Yeah. First one, maybe for the board. Um, I was wondering, just for context, I know there's been discussion about the location of the high school, about moving it, about a potential merger, and I was just wondering if that's informing the decisions that we're making about maintenance at the high school or any new projects or if we're just going ahead with anything at the high school? I'm going to, Libby can jump in and stop me when she, when she wants. The middle school, this is me talking, the middle school suffered for a long time because there was a lot of what ifs and maybe we should and all that. And anybody that's been through the middle school, you guys went through the middle school, um, you, what, what grade are you guys in? Tenth. Say that? Tenth. Tenth. Twelve. Twelve. If you guys, have you guys been in the middle school lately? No. Go to the middle school. I have. I go there for mentoring. How does it look compared to what it used to look like? It's quite a bit better, yeah. Say that again? I think it's quite a bit better. It's quite a bit better. And that's exactly so. So for me, and Libby can stop me and you guys can stop me, the idea of, well, we might do something in the future, so let's not, like, if you do that 20 years the school just goes, you let things go, and then people really go, well, why are we fixing this up with junk? You know, for that, that, that school suffered for so long for people saying, ah, it's terrible, it's junk, why are we investing any money? And all we did was got the mechanical systems working, got the floors clean, you know, boxed in pipes that were half boxed in, and now you go over there and go, wow, you know, save the windows. You go over there and go, wow, this is a nice place, and it looks great. So, that's me. That's me. I don't think waiting for yeah. future decisions. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think one of the reasons I want to move forward with the process that we started is because I, I, one of the things that I'm at least concerned about is that with the flooding, we're going to get this constant, well, it's in a floodplain, why are you investing in that school? And I think we need to answer that question. And if, if we want to keep the location of the high school, I think we should make a decision to do that in a reasonable period of time with community input with all the facts and say, yes, like we're in a floodplain, but we're going to continue to invest in the school. This is going to be where our high school is going to be, at least for this foreseeable future. And we're going to do it in a way to make those investments as flood resilient as possible. And if we come up with a different answer, we come up with a different answer. But I, I think it's unhealthy, as, as Andrew said, to kind of have these these conversations just in the ether of like, well, hypothetically, we might merge with U32, so why are we, we spending money on anything? Or hypothetically, we might build a new high school. I, you know, yes, at some point, but I think we have some immediate questions like, you know, is, is a merger realistic? Is it realistic in a time frame that should affect our decisions? Is moving to high school realistic? Is it realistic in a time frame that it's going to affect our decisions? And if the answer to those questions are no, then we have to continue to make sure we have a high school that is being updated and meeting the needs of students. Well, and even if the answer is yes, but it's going to take 20 years. Then, yeah, then, or yeah exactly. Years. Then we have to invest in, in that way. Yeah. So, um, and Mia it, had yeah. made the point about, so last, at, the, at our last meeting, we approved the request for, for proposals to go out with a, a firm, an architectural firm, to survey all of our facilities and then make recommendations, like present the board at our, in around May. Yeah. With some, so. with a series of recommendations of how to move forward with the facilities. So, if one of those recommendations really resonated with the board and and mm -hmm. included closing the high school, it would be with enough notice in May to not move forward with some of these yeah. more expensive capital improvement projects for the high school. So, I think it's like a let's wait and see what that. Come, that report comes back with, and then discuss our options in May, and then if we need to pivot and make changes around improvements, we can do it at that time, you know, or with that in mind. But I think it's more likely what Mia also just said, is that even if there is sort of an option on the table that looks appealing, it's not gonna be happening in the next few years. 
Yeah, if, even if it's like you know, like a five year time frame of we're gonna build a high school, but it's gonna take like a year to find land and then like a year to map it out and then two or three years for construction. We would, I think, continue to invest in the current high school in a way to keep it up. But there might be some things that we like, you know, if, if the, you know, if it's one of those things where can we stretch the roof for a little longer, we might do that. Yeah. And the beauty of what, the beauty of what Tom has built there at the school is he was really, he's been there for 10 years and he was always the chip away at a little bit all the time, a little bit all the time. And so we are, like this year, we typically do, you know, two, three classrooms in each of the buildings. This year, knowing how much we had going on at the other schools, we said, well, let's just do one, let's just do the classroom 101 at the high school, just because that's where the public after hour meetings can happen. So, like, you're always moving forward. So, if you slow down a little bit, it's okay. You know, if you put your effort somewhere, but you're always moving forward a little bit. Because if you stop moving forward, then you're like, then you really got to spend a lot of money to make it nice. So, um, yeah, and, and it's. And, and one more thing to add to that, yeah. one more thing that we did a few years ago. I think in response to middle school, because I think there were two things going on with the middle school. One is kind of the conversation of why are we spending money in the middle school? Like, you know, is, is it the best place? The second is we we didn't really have a capital plan or kind of a a real systematic schedule for continued maintenance, and and we instituted a capital plan. So every year there's there's a certain amount of money that the voters approve that goes towards continued maintenance. So that way we are. Kind of systematically keeping up with with the needs of our buildings. One other question, just to be abundantly clear, because of the rumors that I keep hearing around the high school, is it safe to be in all of the buildings? Absolutely, right now? absolutely. Like I said, they, there is. It, we do air testing every every week. The results are on the on the web page. Um, you can look at them yourself, and uh, that's our that's our goal every day is to make sure the buildings are as safe as possible, and right. safe, not well, safe as possible, safe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for? Oh yeah, we had a kitchen fire too at the high school <laughs> two days before school. <laughs> yeah. What is the timeline for the proposals? How does that look? They, so the proposals are due October 2nd, I think. Uh, we've gotten, I've started to get some feedback. Um, we posted them on uh, Works in Progress, which is an industry uh, construction and consulting um, clearinghouse. Uh, that, uh, so it was, it's been posted there. It was posted on the AIA's website. I actually sent it out to firms that I was aware of and shared it with, with them and asked them if other, other uh, you know, if they knew other people that were interested so that it went directly to a few firms. I'm starting to get some feedback. Uh, got some questions from a firm today, which to me indicates they're interested and they want to know more. Uh, I've also gotten feedback from uh, an educational consultant who did some work up in Burlington years ago uh, that no, they're not interested. So um, I think that if we, uh, we'll, I think Libby and I discussed this about, you know, let's give it a little see what the feedback is, see if we're getting lots of, firms are not shy to say, hey, we're interested, but we just don't have enough time to put this proposal together. You know, can we get an extension? I think if we, if we, Libby and I will circle back with each other and kind of decide, well, do we, do we amend it and, and uh, you know, give another two weeks out there for people to put proposals together? Um, or we stay with the October 2nd and see what comes in and, and work with that. But I think we're, we're about to that point that next week we'll have to make that decision um, where we stand. Unfortun unfortunately, the, it was a short time frame, and unfortunately, it's just the world we live in now. It, the, the, I submitted it to Works in Progress, and it took a week before someone before I get a confirmation that it was up and in the right spot, and it wasn't. And so we lost a week there. Same thing with AIA. I sent it in, didn't see it, didn't see it. Hey, did you get it? Well, well let me see. Oh, here it is. Let me put it. And so, you know, we took a relatively short timeline and we lost a little bit of time in just the process. So, um. yeah, go for it. Um, my question is um, about back to the flood. Um, so, 
When at the high school you recovered really quickly and due to your, a lot to your hard work and also anticipation. Um, what, what, um, so the, if, if the water level had been higher than it was um, by X number of feet, do you feel like, um, you know, the high school would have been worse off? Oh, um, gosh. If we had, if, I think if, I think if the water was eight inches higher, we would be, we would be renting space at the Berlin Mall for classes because we would have had to tear out all the, all the carpet. We would have had to, luckily there's not a lot of jip board in there. You know, a lot of it's block walls, but anything that was wood or jip board or any of that would have just, it would have been like a, any, any other store downtown. We would have had to gone there and, and gutted anything that was wet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, absolutely. No, we were, we, it was inches. It was inches. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, and I hadn't, I had never, I hadn't heard that anywhere else. Um, you know, one thing that this is kind of wacky, but I'm interested in if it, if it doesn't already exist, um, developing a contingency plan. So if the high school did have eight inches more of water and a, and a flood, you know, where would the students go? Um, and to have that prepared ahead of time and thought out ahead of time. It's not a bad idea. But I it guess might depend on what's available too at the time. Also, is it possible to build anything that would shield the, not really. You can slow it down, but I mean, you look at, I mean, the post office had flood flood mitigation those barriers in front of the that that was flood mitigation i don't know how people's bank I know it's not people's bank anymore um but you can you can slow it down you can you can you can reduce it you can you can certainly reduce it but um it's never it's never going to be totally dry well but just you know making that eight inches 12 inches right. is a big you know get saving four inches i mean that's Building, you know, that space that that's a lot of a lot of potential damage. Yeah. You know, four inches is, is a lot of yeah, potential I'm not damage. Yeah, sure. Unfortunately, the wall goes right down. You know, you'd have to you'd have to jack it up. Yeah, you'd have to build a moat. You'd have to build a wall. Essentially, you'd build a wall around it that have sections that pulls out that you could then drop back in. Just to uh, move us along a little yeah. bit. This is the reason why one of the reasons why we put out the RFP so yeah. we could spend time talking and make the architects and engineers to come in and give us some options on this. And that's, that's, that was kind of the question is, the, are these types of things in their purview? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of, you know, we, we went at this Possibly. with a, what, what could we do? So yeah. there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of options. And, um, we'll, yeah. and, and whoever we get will help us with those and manage them and so the one last piece and we can go to the, the next phase is uh we did have before the construction at main street and union uh we did have the buildings tested for pcbs they all they they all came in and all the, both buildings came in under any actionable levels i believe this building is scheduled for the spring and the high school next year no i think it's on pause <clears throat> the program it's 2025. It's 25 for both of them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't. So have they unpaused I don't the think program? They, I don't think they ever paused it. Oh, they didn't? I thought that they had They were that. talking about it, but I don't yeah. think they Oh, were. but they never officially paused yeah. it. Did not pause it. And, uh, uh, okay. but, but the uh, levels of the number of schools who are coming back as having massive PCBs in them are mounting. So um, mm. the question of who who is responsible for fixing this when we have full high schools that need to be replaced is, is going to come to the legislature very soon, this session. Yeah, I had a, a question that doesn't need to be answered now, but just thinking about, you know, the state report that's going to be coming out that's sort of doing an inventory of all the schools statewide, you know, the flooding that's occurred, you know, just how that conversation will play out at the legislative level and discussions around funding. Like, I'm curious, will... And it's a limited pot of money, but you know, will there be thinking about you know, kind of climate uh, 
crisis resiliency, you know, funds for, you know, schools play a major function in our communities from educating our kids to being emergency shelter spaces, um, you know, so I, I'm curious if there'll be any discussion like at that level of um, supports, <clears throat> just funding opportunities to really look at those um, resiliency measures for updating or improving our, our facilities. Um, or to develop contingency plans and things like that so we can be kind of on the ready versus just reacting. So the school construction will be a topic of conversation in both the Ed and or the House and Senate committees this year. It started last year. VSA under Jeff Francis's leadership is pushing school construction. I don't believe there's a particular bend towards climate change because many of our schools, regardless of climate, are old buildings that are falling apart in Vermont. So, uh, but school school construction uh, money is going to be a topic of conversation in the legislature this year. Okay, thank you. Great. Other questions or can we move to the next step? Then? Well, thank you, Andrew. This is super important. Obviously, facilities is gonna be a big part of our discussion this year so appreciate all the fantastic information and great work and i'm sure we'll be seeing more of you well sticking with facilities andrew can't leave yet wondering if this included andrew at all yeah no i'm happy to say that yeah, Andrew can't leave yet. Um, one of the pieces that we want to put in front of the board because um, in preparation for budget season is district space needs. Um, so uh, I apologize that this didn't get out to the board or isn't it, wasn't in the public packet, but I'm sure Anna has it up on the website or will have it up on the website very shortly. I'm sorry? We got hard copies here too. Oh, okay. Um, so just to go through this um, relatively quickly, uh, in the last five years, we've added 11 positions to our district-wide staff, and these are non-classroom positions. Um, and so with any non-classroom positions, you have to find a place for people to hang their hats and, and do their work. Uh, and that's, a, that's an increase of 61%. So there's been a lot of, of positions and on this first page of overview of district staff and Anna, if you're still around, if you want to um, put this on the screen so the public and ORCA can see it in real time. Um, so the bolded items on the district wide staff that have been the added ones are bolded on this sheet. And uh, what's really nice is Anna linked the all the websites to this as well. So um, going back to the superintendent's report, one of the things that we've talked about is is upping our, our website game here. So if you click on any of those links, they go straight to our website and you can see what some of these people are doing. Um, but 11 positions are certainly a lot. So Anna, let's keep going. Most of the central office and district-wide staff are held at Montpelier High School. And Andrew and, and Anna did a nice job at putting maps down for you so you could see just in real time and real color how much of the space is currently being used by central office staff. Um, so this is current space use that is in oh, front. Hold on, Libby, we just lost you oh. on audio in the room. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> I feel like a cell phone commercial. Um, so this is the current space use, um, as you can see. Uh, some of the things just to point out, both An Andrew, who is probably our most important employee over the summer um, in terms of flooding at Montpelier High School, did not have an office space to lay his head. He was walking around aimlessly and trying to find spaces that uh, didn't have people in them. And so um, Andrew currently is in an office at, at Montpelier High School, but him and Nick Connor have moved uh, for the past three years. So Nick's moved every year he's been there. Um, and Andrew almost has moved offices every year that he's been uh, working for us. And that will be the spot for the electrical closet. If we, if we move our electrical <laughs> out of the basement, that's where it'll go. 127, yeah. room 127 here, okay. Where it says facilities director, that will be that will become the electrical closet. So that will no longer be available as an office space um, pretty shortly. 
So we take up a whole lot of that first floor of Montpelier High School. The whole second floor is not actually um, represented here because uh, because district-wide staff is not in as much in the second floor. Those are mainly classes. Um, but if keep going, Anna. So proposed for Montpelier High School, um, they we've run out of space for curriculum and programming at Montpelier High School. Uh, we need space for non-classroom teaching professionals there. We All of our teacher advisories, which happen, um, I believe, daily. Mary Menelar would be able to tell us that. Um, we don't, not all teacher advisories have room. Um, so they meet in alternative spaces, conference rooms, and that kind of thing. There's very few spaces for private um, specialized instruction or caregiver meetings. Um, when a student needs a space to calm down, there are very few um, spaces that they could do that in the high school that are not public or, you know, directly in front of a main thoroughfare for students. Um, so private de-escalation spaces. Uh, we are in need of adaptive learning spaces to teach life skills. Our world language classes are teachers flip-flop classes because there's not enough classes classrooms available. Our essential, the flexible pathway space is quite small um, and they do a lot of things. They have a lot of plans to bring people into the building for um, to give students more access to different career paths. And currently we can't do that. Um, we'd like to, we're really interested in expanding uh, some of our curricular offerings, but it's really hard to do that when you don't have any classroom space for that expansion. For PE, they do all their class. So if kids are doing some sort of um, pen and paper assessment, they're doing it on the floor in the PE class. Um, and there is some classwork that PE wants to do that could do, that they could do more wellness kind of stuff, um, wellness learning. They had more of classroom spaces. Um, and project-based learning spaces, it's pretty it's uh, pretty limited right now with what we can do. Um, we have one classroom that is dedicated to product, two classrooms, if you can, if you include the wood shop, dedicated to project-based learning. The rest are set up as strict classrooms. So there's a lot of uses that Montpelier High School is eyeing. Um, and with central office taking up so much of the space, uh, these become... Uh, pretty much impossible for them to do in terms of visioning and innovating for the future. Keep going, Anna. So some more proposed usage. Um, we are looking for more intervention spaces. Um, again, we're gonna be losing an office because the electrical panel will be moved there. We're looking for some dedicated de-escalation spaces, world languages, expanding that program math rooms, multilinguals classrooms. Um, right now, all of these spaces are shared, uh, which makes it pretty hard to um, to really find a foothold with, with uh, teachers and students. And then having a very dedicated social emotional learning and special education suite for specialized services when kids need that. Keep going, Anna. At Union, we have fewer district-wide employees. This is their, the map of the second floor or part of their second floor. Um, district-wide employees aren't necessarily in the first floor, um, but that mainly that square at the top there are is our that special education wing um, or special education suite that came from when Union was renovated, I think in the 80s. Um, and you can see our instructional coaches are there, the special education evaluators there. Right now, the school psychologist is there. This is primarily the only, the only rooms we had left. Um, and they're pretty tiny spaces that were meant for one-on-one -on -one student work when the, when that area was built. We do have money dedicated to renovate this space and the renovation ideally will be more focused on student social emotional needs and specialized learning spaces, much like what the high school would like to do. Um, so right now it's an adult space and we'd really like to renovate that to become a student space, but we have to get district employees out of there to make it happen. And then we have instructional coaches and more of our tech people at Union Elementary School. So I believe, yeah, the proposed spaces, more space for students and families to work privately, so currently at Union, we have two school counselors. They share an old classroom um, wow. with temporary. Do you lose me again? Yes, no. we can hear you. Oh, 
Uh, so the school counselors at Union share one classroom with a temporary wall, in, you know, like a, a replaceable wall, one that can fold up, uh, which doesn't add much privacy for families or for students in need um, of private spaces to talk with an adult. Uh, Katie's really looking to add flexible learning spaces for teachers and students. We have a book room inside the conference room at Union, which the board saw during the retreat. So that makes the book room not accessible when the conference room is being used. The conference room is used quite a bit for meeting spaces for families and teachers, and they're looking for small group learning spaces. At the middle school, not many district-wide staff is at the middle school because the middle school is quite literally completely out of space. Um, for everything. Uh, there's not a whole lot of spaces that aren't classrooms at the middle school, but we do have um, some of our tech team there and we do have one instructional coach in, in a very strange type of room on the third floor there. Um, so we do have some district-wide staff there and the middle school would eat up the chance to get district-wide staff out of their building so that they could use these for student uses. And their proposed student uses is, would be to increase the small and in, small group and individual learning spaces, create an appropriate conference room. The middle school currently does not have a conference room, um, which they need for meetings of a larger size. They, they simply use classrooms now. Um, you can keep going. So we're proposed, we will be proposing to the board to move central office out of our Montpelier school buildings. Um, the advantage of this is that the directors, the central office directors will have immediate access to their teams. Um, for example, Mike's tech team is all over the place. It makes for very, for a lot of inefficiencies with response to tech needs. Uh, less moving of offices each year. We would like Andrew and Nick to have one space and, and the rest as well. Every year, if we add any type of position, and even if we don't add, it's always meetings with the principals and walking through spaces saying, hey, could we move this closet? We've renovated more than a few closets to become office spaces. We have, I think, two closets left at the middle, at the high school that we have discussed making into office spaces for people. Um, and they're, they're simply not appropriate. There's reduction in the amount of parking spaces used at MHS. The board has heard, particularly from our students' representatives, that we run out of parking every year at, in the middle school, especially when our sophomores start getting their license and driving. Um, the proposed location is central to the Montpelier schools. It's in downtown Montpelier. There's a, there would be a dedicated common space, a beautiful space for school board meetings that would make it more accessible for our public, especially when they're in-house at our meetings to hear. Um, it's not a library space that makes um, hearing and seeing, seeing presentations and things difficult. Um, there'd be more secure and central storage. Currently, our, our storage is at Montpelier High School and at um, non-ADA and compliant room since we can't use it for students since it's not ADA compliant. It's upstairs with no other way to access the space except for stairs. Um, so our employees have to access it and, and it's not ADA compliant. Uh, a welcoming space for visitors. When visitors come into the central office, there are literally two chairs in the main court, the, between two desks for people to sit, not ex exceptionally welcoming to people. We have very few district-wide meeting spaces. We mainly use um, MHS's meeting spaces, which takes up more of their, their space. And there's a lot of pressure on custodial staff with all the outside usage, for, particularly at MHS. Some of the disadvantages of consolidating central office off-site, and if you wanna keep going for me, is the cost. It's expensive. There's, we're talking about a lot of people who would need space. And so there is an increased cost to moving the central office out of the schools, which we'll get into in a minute. And less student contact from central office ministers. I like being with the students every day. So I would I would certainly miss that. And I know that the the rest of the, the central office staff would miss that. We would have to up our game in, in terms of making sure that we are making contact with students more. So the proposed space is over behind Skinny Pancake. It is currently where the um, Vermont, I'm going to get this wrong, Andrew, Vermont cities, towns, leagues. Cities and towns. Yeah, <laughs> that space there, they, they, are, they are almost entirely virtual now. Um, so they're looking to uh, find somebody to rent out the rest of their contract. 
we actually would not take their entire space because it's ginormous. We would split it, um, split it in half, essentially, or the the people who own the building would be splitting it in half for us. The cost includes everything. It would be all inclusive. So our custodial staff would not be having to take care of us um, and, and includes parking and all of that kind of thing for our employees. We would have to pay for internet and that piece. And there'd be some initial costs for startup in this space. Um, but if you keep going, Anna, it would be a true central office space. So Anna and, and Andrew have kind of put a little, put some ideas. You can see how all of us would be right together and consolidated um, so that we are easily accessible to each other um, at all times. And that we would also have a nice seating area for any guests who came in, um, a couple different conference rooms to use in terms of district and community usage. And um, it'd be just, it would be a, a space for the central office team to to be together and, and have more space in our buildings for, for students, which is what we really would like. Oh, and there's just a couple pictures of the space right now. Um, that top right corner, the yellow, with the yellow wall there, that is the boardroom, I believe, which is, which is a nice space for, for board meetings to occur. Um, so that's something that we wanted to put in front of the board because it will be a big ask during budget season and this budget season may be tricky, a tricky one. Um, but we did want to get it in front of you early so that you'd have plenty of time to think and, and, uh, talk that through as a, as a group. Great. Questions for Libby about... I mean, I, I think it's a great needed idea that the cost is something you have to very seriously consider, but right. are there trade-offs in the budget that will make it possible or is it, it purely additive? Hmm? Is it purely additive? Yeah, right. Is it, is it, a, is it just plus adding on to the ask of the budget or are there things that are in, in your mind that are going to uh, provide space, budgetary space? We haven't gotten to that level of detail yet right in the budget planning, um, but we have spoke, all of our principals are, are right on board with this idea. So um, we have talked about if, if this is what we want for this, this budget year, then we're going to have to make some, some um, we're going to have to make some choices elsewhere in order to make this happen. Um, and everybody's understanding of that. But yeah. we haven't gotten into the level of detail to be able to, to share with you yet. More to come. Uh, how long is the lease that we'd be picking up? How long does that last? I think they've got, I think the, so the way it's set up is the, the league has this space locked in for, I think it's another two years. Uh -huh. And, um, but the realtor, the owner of the building, they're also very flexible. They could buy them out if we committed to two years or be a subletter to uh -huh. them. So there's, but fundamentally this is, it's a two year. And then the longer we made a commitment for, the happier they would be and sure. the more negotiation we would have with them. Uh-huh. But. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think, uh, I, I mean, I would venture to guess that most other school districts have a separate building for their uh, central office staff. Um, so I think it, it does make sense. And I'm surprised we've been able to sort of like cobble it together and make it work for as long as we have. Um, I do have a couple questions. My first question was, so when I look at the list of employees, um, are instructional coaches only adult facing or do they also interface with students? Sorry, oh. turned off my video instead of, <laughs> instead of <laughs> unmute myself. Um, they are primarily adult adult teachers. They're teachers of adults, primarily. That's not to say that they don't work with students occasionally, particularly if they're demonstrating a teaching concept to an adult, um, but they are not responsible for, for students. Okay. So yeah, and again, just kind of what you touched on, on one of, one of the sort of potential drawbacks. The other thing I think of when I look at this list is, is, is there any benefit of any of these folks on this list remaining in the buildings? Like, is it an all or nothing? Or could we look at 
some positions, maybe wellness staff or something, being, you know, remaining in schools because they want to have closer contact with students, or are you really seeing it as sort of like an... The um, pre-K through fourth grade SEL coach would obviously stay primarily at Union um, and mm -hmm. visit RVS and the K and the... Um, Sorry, there's the fifth through, sorry, the fifth through eighth grade SEL coach would obviously stay at the middle school and not be, um, they probably have a space at the, at a consolidated central office for when they need to be there. Um, but they would, their primary home would stay in those buildings. Okay. And then my last question is just around like money. It's a little bit of sticker shock. It's about $250,000 a year um, to pay for the lease. And I'm just wondering if it's been floated by anybody or if you guys have discussed the potential of purchasing a property rather than leasing. Well, I'll let Andrew answer that question. <laughs> um, not, not in two We, I made a couple of inquiries primary, initially over to, um, uh, to Steve Avery over at the credit union about the building on the corner. They were trying to decide whether they were going to keep it, sell it, lease it, um, but that the flood kind of changed that. So this was this was an opportunity that um, this building we're kind of using this as the test model because it's big enough, it's fit up, it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. If if there is a if there is a desire to push this even further, look at it further, um, we absolutely would would reach out to a broader base of and and the real estate market has changed in Montpelier in the last two months <laughs> so uh, there may be opportunities that weren't there two months ago and there may be less opportunities in some respects that there than there was two months ago so this was just this is just a, a really good test case of it's a good space in the right location it's a great space in the right location and with a you know with a with a some real knowns about how many people would fit there and how much it costs to actually really rent a space like this. So I think absolutely that if, if there was a desire to go further, we would keep looking. Yeah. Yeah, because... Yeah, one, one of the challenges we came up with is that a lot of the buildings in Montpelier that aren't state-used state are older, um, and they are not going to be there for as long as you know, an old house isn't going to do it for us. We need, we need some other structure for that. So that was one of the challenges Andrew was running into when we were looking at multiple spaces. Finding proper office space. Yeah, yeah it does feel like in, in the two-year lease, we're going to spend close to $500,000, and that feels like a good down payment on a property. You know, just, but, so that's, that's my biggest sort of concern is like, is this an opportunity for us as a district to invest in a property that becomes an asset for the district rather than renting? Which seems like a good question for the survey process we're about to enter. Mm -hmm. um, but that does get, remind me of a follow-up, which is, were there any other spaces you considered and then turned down? Uh, we, were, we were in the process of continuing to look, again, the sort of, this was, one level, one space, not bro ten thousand or eight to ten thousand. However, we you know wherever it's a lot of space to yeah. find in one level, and and then it started to rain. So, oh, some of this further fine tuning of space searching kind of gotcha. Got okay, to the back seat. So, it um, it might be helpful if there if you had a chance to do a moderate survey of what's out there just to be able to make a comparison. This looks ideal. There's, it's not hard to see that this looks ideal for some district central office staff, but just to be able to give us, as we're thinking about the impact of the budget, if there are other options that we can say, yeah, we could do this, but it's actually not as good for these other reasons, or hey, actually we found something that's even, that's maybe not quite as good, but is gonna cost way less, you know. I don't think that's gonna be the case. Yeah. You, 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 I cert certainly think that looking for other space is, is Prudent, you know, we should continue. But this is this is realistic. Yep. This is real. This is what it's it costs to get good space that that's going to serve people well, that people are going to want to be in, and people are going to want to come visit, and and you know, yep. isn't going to be. Ugh, all right, I go down the stairs to go visit my assistant or or my coworker or whatever that they're sure. in one level. 
Um, I guess my first question is for um, Libby. Um, are, are the 29 district staff all uh, in person every day? Yes, we don't work. We, we don't work virtually, <laughs> except for you know myself. <laughs> Okay. Um, the, re the reason I asked that is because of like, you know, sort of creative, modern office space, um, you know, where it's like more of a hoteling situation where like people may not have dedicated space, but it's sort of a shared space and that can potentially reduce footprint. Um, but then that might not be a possibility here if everybody is in person every day. Um, but, um, you know, the other thing like, that is apparent to me is that, you know, when you think about 11 new positions, um, you know, the, the cost associated with them is usually like their salary and benefits. But in this case, you also have, you know, the 11 new positions precipitate the rental of a $20,000 per month office space. So, um, you know, it's something to consider like optics wise. Um, you know, like you, you're incrementally increasing the positions and then it comes to a point where you need a whole new office, you know, building. Um, so, um, yeah, just wanted to say that. I think something that <clears throat> stood out to me also was, you know, not only just the, you know, the need for more admin space, and I'll echo too, I mean, it's just like geographically, if you look, it's like this space is like, is literally like the central hub between the three, the three Montpelier based schools. So I certainly see um, just sort of the ease of that and folks to kind of get to those schools easily um, and almost in equal time. But um, I'm also just looking at all of the, um, kind of the identified needs um, that aren't currently being met. And I'm thinking about those things in terms of like, what of those kind of things can be solved just by way of like swapping spaces um, or just adding a new space. And then I'm seeing like, an, you know, additional things that would actually require seemingly some investment of, of resources, like an adaptive learning space to teach skills, um, like project-based learning classrooms. That sounds awesome. You know, what, what are we, what would we be looking at, you know, for something like that or like flexible teaching spaces? So I am curious about some of those other things and it feels like some of the, these ideas are really exciting. Um, and I also wonder, you know, how this can kind of be used as a document to sort of just help inspire some of the conversations as we pull community members together when we're talking about like the future use of our schools. I think sometimes like for parents invested, you know, caregivers and families, like we spend very little time inside of the schools and where many of us are also not in the world of like education innovation. So we don't even necessarily know what's possible, you know, of what it could be in our schools. So some of this just feels kind of helpful for that dialogue um, that will be upcoming. But so I guess, yeah, what I'm also thinking about is like, you know, the added cost of, you know, a monthly rent. And then I'm thinking about, oh, you know, and are we going to want to do these things too? And what are the costs and how does that fit into capital plan and, um, and things like that? So um, that's just something that stuck out to me, like exciting things. And also some of them certainly seem to have um, a price tag. And um, as, and this is just like the other in the in the kind of wheel of options, um, renovating existing buildings, adding on to existing buildings. I have no idea. I mean, is that even viable, worthy? You know, I know Main Street Middle is like tight. It's on a small, you know, lot. UES. You know, they're like very old historic buildings. I have no idea. But I just wonder, like in the wheel of options of things you've considered, you know, as we have to, you know, represent this to the public in our communities, like, you know, these are all the things that kind of were looked at and are just not considered to be viable for, you know, X number of reasons. So that could be helpful. Is, I mean, I'm, I'm sensing that the desire is to have a space for next school year. Is there, um, you know, beyond, I mean, I understand like sort of the limited space argument, but like if there was a need to wait a year, is that possible or is it sort of like you've really gotten to a point where you've 
outgrown the buildings and it like really kind of needs to happen by fall of 2024. I would argue that we have outgrown the buildings. We, there is no more space. Um, we have students who need de-escalation and we literally have no space to do that at the high school. That's not public, that, that other kids can't see it happening. Um, and for a high school kid, that's just not okay. Um, so I'd, I'd argue that we are out of space. Um, we cannot innovate at the high school in particular because of the, the amount of space that central office uses. So there, there is no space and they are sharing classrooms now, um, particularly world languages. And the other piece that I would worry about, and, and granted, things have changed because of Montpelier's flood. So, um, is that there, this space would not be available in a year. Um, they, they are moving and, and on this space and they've already, we already had more space available to us at, um, the city place area and they've rented that out to to food pantry and other good uses as well already so they're already um kind of dissecting the space and, and moving on so i would i would say that we would need to find a different space and that might be possible based on what has happened in montpelier you know like as andrew said earlier it's a it's a completely different world in downtown montpelier right now and, and no one really knows what's happening there so um I know that he's talked to, Andrew's talked to the the state to see if the state had it because lots of state, state employees are working from home. So could we rent some of that space? But now it seems as if the, the state is trying to get those rebuilt and renovated now. So it's it's up in the air, totally up in the air. I do think this space would not be available to us in a year. I just echo Kristen's um, feeling of, and I think um, other people have mentioned sort of like the the need for information on like what other options have been explored. Um, and because I know like even, even during the discussion on Front Porch Forum that happened around like moving the school or getting rid of the high school, there are several pretty public like um, that that are in the public awareness buildings that people point to, like, why wouldn't you be able to use this or that or this? And so like, for example, Vermont College um, will be one of them that people will say, you know, did you look into renting space up there or buying one of those buildings? And so I just would like to have that information at the fingertips to be like, this is why buying, um, you know, a million dollar property in Montpelier isn't the right way to go and it's better to rent. This is why building new um, wouldn't work. This is why renovating the high, building a third floor in the high school wouldn't work. Um, you know, this is why we narrowed down all the options to this particular space. I agree. So cognizant of time, um, it seems like there's interest in pursuing this with the board, but we want a little more information on other options. And so probably the next step, Rhett. I think it's really important that you have space that allows you to do the highest quality work that you possibly yeah. can do. And I just want to put that out there, that the space allows you to just have no environmental inhibitions or prohibitions um, I don't think that UES's basement is good for that, but there's a lot of space in UES's basement that's not being utilized necessarily. Um, and I don't know what it would be used yeah. for, but it's a lot of space. There's a lot of junk in it. I know that. You use a lot of that but yeah, but I mean, I don't know what, I don't know whether or not, I don't know whether or not it could be used for anything, but creative, more creative people than myself might think of things not central office. That's not what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I think that you should, that yeah, no, that's, that's not, I think that, I yeah. think it's important that you have space that allows you to do the highest pos quality possible work that you can do. I, I agree with Rhett and I saw a lot of nods around the table to yeah. that sentiment. Uh, are you, what is your timeline? Is this something that's going into the budget planning process for next, this, for next year's budget? Is. Or is this you would like to move out of your offices next month? Oh, no, no, no. 
Okay. Yeah, this is for this is for this budget. Get it in Sorry. front of you for um, the budget yeah. conversation. Great. Really? Okay. Yeah. So you'll, you'll see this again in the budget conversation. Right. So when we see it again, maybe there would be those other like here are the other things we've considered but don't make sense kind yeah. of information included. Yeah. No, yeah. I I think I think exactly <laughs> that. We're gonna I think we're gonna want to be able to explain the community why a quarter million dollars at SpaceX is the best and most prudent option. And I think, you know, right now, the fact that it was the only one before us is not that explanation, yeah. so. Uh, um, I also totally wholeheartedly agree with what Rhett said. Um, and I'm just sort of like, is there a better option that's just more yeah. economical for the long term? And if there was sort of the appetite to purchase a building or build a building, um, you know, financially, if that sentiment were to be um, palatable to people on the board and in the community, would there be some sort of like graduated plan that could allow you to create the space that you need in the immediate sense that would require less, way less office space and therefore be a lot cheaper just for like next school year. Like if we were to move all of, you know, the people who are in the central office suite that you're in out and would that create enough space to sort of like alleviate the immediate pressure or something like that? Maybe half of the office space that you're presenting or a third. <laughs> you know, like let's say we did that for like two or three years while we got the plan in place to build a new building or purchase another building. I think that would probably fall under options that that, that you've all asked us to, to look into. So I think that would, that's where that would fall. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, no. Um... Yeah, I think we're all very supportive of making sure you have the space. Uh, we just need to vet the expense a little more, especially because um, I don't think this is going to be the easiest of budget years. So uh, we've got community outreach uh, concerning budget development and future presentations. We're at 830. We've also we... got superintendent eval launch, but I think that will actually be really quick. Yeah. Um, do we want to delve into that now with a few people out, or do we want to kind of put that at the top of the agenda for the next meeting? Um, Which, what's the that you're talking about? The, both of those two items. I'll say on the um, community outreach, thank you, Andrew. I, yes. Right? Or can we say, yes. let Andrew go you home? Guys, <laughs> you guys want to pack this place up for, yeah. You guys want to pack this place up Thank you. Thank you. Um, on Thanks, the Sandra. community outreach opportunities concerning the budget, we have one that's coming up before our next meeting, which is the fall festival. Yes. Where does that table go? The center table. I think we just put okay. that to the side. Thank you. Um, and I would really like to get as much board participation in that as possible because the whole community will be there, and it yeah. seems like a really great opportunity. Um, I would. I think it would be helpful for us to know what we would like what information is good to share and what questions are good to ask when we're approaching the community about the budget because we're not going to i don't think we're going to just ask open-ended questions like what do you think we should spend money on i think we need to frame the conversation a little bit more so i think it would be helpful to talk about that tonight just so that we're prepared for the fall can can really make the most yeah. of the fall festival i mean sh go to the fall festival and have a good time too <laughs> but it does seem like a really good community engagement opportunity in advance of budget season too. Yeah, Alara? Um, so I'm actually helping MC the fall festival. Yeah. So if you want to give me like a little script, I can stand up in front of people and be like, I'll try to make it a little funny because that's what I like to do, but I, I'm a resource for that if you want. Thank you. Yeah. We could use all the funny <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when it comes to talking about the budget. She's very good. That's awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that makes sense, um, at least to frame up kind of what we want to do for the fall festival. I mean, a suggestion that I have, I think we talked about this earlier, Mia, is maybe put some sort of idea board at a table and, and put it in buckets of kind of, you know, where people feel their needs, like, you know, academics, facilities, um, you know, 
Are you staffing this table, Mia? I'm um, hoping we there will be many board members staffing this table. Oh, because I'm already staffing popcorn. <laughs> Maybe we can stand next to each other. <laughs> right, could be right there. Yeah. yeah. And then you all can volunteer for popcorn as well. <laughs> Perfect. Just rotate back and forth. Yeah. So your idea of an idea board, Jim, is that people would then like like a sticker? Yeah. Well, like they'd take a sticker and say, this is where I think academic, like where money should be spent? Yes. Is that what you mean? And sticker, or I, I would say just you have, just have a pen. And just Some markers, write. and they yeah. can markers, write what they're like. Write what they're, new playground at MSMS. Yeah, yeah, under yeah. facilities. Yeah, Got it. Cafeteria. Like, okay. Um, yeah. Um, Makerspace. Makerspace. Uh huh. A pool. Uh huh. More parking. Yeah. Parking garage. <laughs> okay. And how much do we want to frame up the challenges of that we are anticipating when it comes to the budget around? I think for the fall festival we can. I mean, actually, that's one thing that I was going to mention to Libby. I think it would be helpful to get a sense to the extent we have a sense of what we're facing from the equity weighting change. Um, and I know that's probably ballpark figures at this point, but I also know it's it's not nothing. Um, so that that might be good just as we go into the, the budget conversation. It would be nice to have some sort of little take away like piece of paper flyer with the schedule sort of in yeah. you know with anticipated um public meetings yeah that, listed oh. that think, you know want to voice <laughs> want to share your voice uh -huh. on the, yeah. in budget season you know or budget creation yeah. and then like some opportunities to do that It'd be nice to and it could have like one double-sided like one side could be the sort of like bullet list of potential dates and then the other side could be some of the like major bullet points that we're going to be considering for Ooh, the budget. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. I don't know if this is the right context, but what, I thought the cons the the waiting study the consequences of the changed pupil weights would be just would sort of occur over multiple years. Is that or is that not true? Because it's, it's all answer. happening at once. I think it's all happening. Um, the, it, ha it happens, the weights will all happen at once yeah. um, for FY25. So next school year, the budget cycle that we're getting into. It's not, it's not. Okay. It's not a phase in. But it's, it's um, a, there is it's a, a. It's a boom. They did put a provision in there that tries to cap um, year-over-year -year tax increases by school district, um, and that uh, you know they're, their legislature is going to be talking about that and how that's going to work, um, kind of uh, in, during the session, I think. Which is after we determine our budget, essentially. Yeah, so <laughs> not not great timing, but um, but yeah. Okay, so we have some ideas of how to bring the budget yeah. to the community at the fall festival. Um, I think we can pick back up at the next meeting on the rest of the yeah. community engagement. Um, and how would you like to handle volunteering at the board table? Should we do that over email? I think so. Maybe even like a Google Doc or over, yeah. And that's like fine to do because it's like scheduling things. Scheduling It's things, like carpooling yeah. Yeah. or like, yeah. The only thing we can't do is like, we're, we're going to spend our money on. Let's, let's have a Google Doc. <laughs> but we can, we can schedule carpools and Okay. And and, yeah, I'm happy to it. put that together and be very encouraging of my fellow board members to yes. join me at the table. Okay. Can I, wear a I hope you do. You I hope you do. Yeah. So.
Are we going to have a dunking thing again? Yeah, yeah, that's happening. Apparently, you haven't been invited to be dunked, so maybe you're off the hook this year. Yeah, I've, I've been dunked in the past. <laughs> I tried to dunk Jim one year. I did not have a very good aim. Yeah. So he other, stayed dry uh, when I was throwing yeah. the ball. No, other people have better aims. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of them just walk right up and... Anyway, okay, I digress. <laughs> Moving on. Um, okay, great. Uh, future presentations. Um, I mean, I just, just two to throw out there, and I think we should talk about it at the next meeting, too. Uh, we do have a couple board members who I don't think have had a presentation on communications, which I think would be great. Um, and I think with all the new data on the website, it would be great to have, you know, some that go through that. And I think just the regular ones, like an update on social, emotional, um, social, yeah, yeah, that. Um, and um, it'd be great for you to think some ideas of some presentations you might want from a student perspective. So yeah, let's let's do that at the next meeting too. And um, and let me like, how many slots do we have for presentations? As many as you want, want basically. You're the board. You tell me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we might have to throw some trainings in there too because we haven't. Um, I think it's always good to. <clears throat> Uh, you know, again, communications, because like, you know, Jake hasn't gone through the, you know, how to communicate as a, a board member. Um, I think getting the latest on hazing, harassment, and bullying from Heather is always great. Uh, I know we've done that semi-recently, but uh, we've had a couple of new board members since then, so. That would be useful for us. Yeah. So right now we're just putting it out there that board members should think about. Should think about presentations. Presentations and they're trainings. interested in. And trainings. And trainings you'd like to have, yeah. And we can come back to it at the next board meeting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and just as an FYI for board members who don't know and the public who doesn't know, in the agenda that goes out on the on the public. There is at the bottom of it a link to the board calendar so you can see what is already planned and upcoming. So for example, there's already three presentations on data data that we get every year, and I think those are already in the calendar. Yeah. So and then you can see like, oh, okay. Um, uh, you know, when could we have something around that or a follow-up presentation on something after the data presentations? It helps helps put that stuff in context. And should we just email you two? And Libby. With, and Libby with our yeah. like desires, suggestions? Yeah, definitely. And then we can you know, take a little time in the next meeting to uh, synthesize those. Yeah, and, and Jake, feel free to suggest whatever, because yeah, you. Okay. You have not had, you had much information. Yeah, and same, same to you, Laura awesome. and Miriam. I mean, basically, it's like any function of the school district. If you want to hear from any of the people that work for the schools about a specific topic, or um, if you hear from other students that they want to hear about something, then you could ask for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, the superintendent evaluation. Yeah, great. Um, new and improved. I think I'm a Bob. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, Libby, can you do my Vanna again? Or actually, maybe it's Anna. Who is Vanna? I think Anna has control unless Libby does now. Libby's going to share her screen so that everybody can look at the. I did email this to the board, um, but now it's now in front of everyone and including on Orca. So the very quick background here is the board has been doing a formal evaluation of the superintendent for three or four years now. At the end of the process last year when the board was deliberating on sort of like the finalization of the evaluation of Libby's performance, we found ourselves really challenged to be able to say, use our, the scoring that we had because the scoring, we didn't really know how to define like what is a four versus a five versus a three. 
And um, that's one of the reasons that we decided to do an update to this. Another was because we, I had spoken with um, Phil Gore, who used to be on staff at the Vermont School Board Association, and who's, um, he, he was just a really helpful resource around how boards can best use a superintendent evaluation and get a little bit more aligned with district goals, superintendent goals, all that stuff. And that was always a little bit muddled for us. So we, um, one of his recommendations was to look to the state of Massachusetts, Massachusetts which spent um, a lot of time and money on establishing a statewide rubric that they that every school committee uses. That's what they call them in Massachusetts. And it's all on their website. And he was like, yeah, go for it. Just use that. <laughs> and so um, that is going to end up saving us a ton of money. Um, but the eval committee, um, Rhett, Jim, myself, and Anna Kett, before he had to leave the board, um, spent a bunch of time looking using that one and comparing it to what we had been using because the language of the previous eval had a lot of our values and a lot of the things. There were things we wanted to make sure we didn't miss by porting over to this new um, evaluation. And so we did a lot of updates to it to make it our own. But it is, um, I think, a much better... Um, framework for us to use. So it has, it follows this framework of four major areas of leadership and within each of those areas of leadership there are indicators that we would be looking for and for every indicator there's proficient, exemplary, n like underperforming <laughs> and needs improvement. Um, and so Libby, if you want, if you could scroll, we'll just give an example of that so people see what they're looking at. So this is the first standard, instructional leadership. Um, curriculum is one of the indicators in there, and then you can see the four columns. This is what unsatisfactory looks like, this is what needs improvement looks like, this is what look, proficient looks like, and this is what exemplary looks like. And that is repeated for the rest of the, I think it's like 17 indicators. I don't think we should spend time going through every single one of those tonight. That's what, but I wanted to give everybody a chance to see it all together so that you know what we are, what this looks like before you start using it. Um, and the, what we will be asking of the board, and then Libby will do this in her own self-evaluation, and just as in previous years, we will ask Libby's team as well for them to fill out an evaluation as well, is deciding where did Libby land in this 2022-23 school year, because we're looking at last school year's performance, on curriculum. Was she unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary? So that's the basic gist of it, and it'll be up to you as a board member to say which one of those you think. Um, you're, we are not going, I wanted to show everyone the Word, this is the Word doc form of it, but we are actually going to fill it out in a Google form so that all of the answers get dropped into one spreadsheet. So Libby, can you show the Google form, please? So we see what that looks like. It's all the same questions. It's all the same information. I just wanted to get it in front of you so you can see what you would actually be filling out. And it says MRPS Superintendent Evaluation 2022-23, the full oh. no longer accepting responses. Not accepting. So let me open, start that. I forgot that that needed to be open. Okay. Should work now. Maybe you just need to refresh to make it work. So again, it's like all the same language. And if you scroll up a little or down a little, Libby, we'll see first you answer which one you are, and then it goes to each one of the questions. And the same language is all there in, in unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, and exemplary. We did add a radio button for I don't know. So there are some things that Libby does that we just don't see in which case we'll be drawing more information from Libby herself and from her team, and it'll be perfectly fine for anyone to say, I just don't know what this looks like. Um, so just wanted to point that out as well. So everyone will just go through, 
click the radio button that you think makes the most sense. If you scroll a little bit further, Libby, I did add at the bottom of each section. So again, there's four main sections. At the, the last question is for Libby, for her team, for us to provide any examples that would support what we, you know, the, the radio buttons that we've clicked. So do we not have the performance indicators in the form? It's just the four. Are all of these sections of the rubric in the form? All of those are in the form. Okay. But they're, they're broken up into four sections, so that's why you didn't see all of them as Libby was scrolling. You have to fill out one section, and then it'll take you to section two. I see. Yeah. Gotcha. Great. Wow. Any other questions to feel ready to start filling this out? I have a quick question. I just wasn't sure why there were some rows that were highlighted blue. That was done in the, the way it was on the Mass website to just, I think, to set rows apart from each other. Okay. And then the reason you might see two in a row that are not blue or two is because yeah. there were some indicators that Massachusetts had that we got rid of because okay. they weren't things that were germane to our district. Gotcha. So the blue doesn't mean anything. Okay. It's just a visual it's just thing. It's pretty. <laughs> gotcha. And when are we supposed, when oh. are you wanting to get? <clears throat> the timeline for this is we'd like the evals to be completed, I believe, by next Friday, bless you. And I can email that as a reminder to everyone. Yes, the, well, October 6th. That's not next Friday, is it? Two Fridays from now? Yeah, two Fridays from now. Two Fridays from now. Are Miriam and I doing this? You may. There wasn't an, well, yeah. You'd be I a guess board member. Board member, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because it's really just offering your insights. And again, one totally fine to, to click, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. But is it specific about performance from the 22, 22 to 23 school year? Yeah. 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 Oh. If you would like to, not, nah, that's okay. Yeah. I don't really know. Yeah. I wasn't right. Paying much attention. Right. That's okay. Well, right, and same with our student reps. Like they weren't, you weren't serving in a board capacity at the mm -hmm. time that this evaluation window. That's true. That applies to. Have to do with like community outreach and community engagement. So if you've got a sense from being yeah. a student or being a caregiver or just being a community member, I mean, I think it might be worth scrolling through and seeing if there's a few where you do know, who do yeah. feel you know. Yeah, we can definitely look. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, no, thank you for putting that in a very user-friendly and organized form. That'll make it we easier. did a lot with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, policy monitoring reports. Motion to approve. We have A21, public participation of board meetings, C1, education records, and D3, responsible computer internet network use. I move we approve the reports for each one of those policies Jim just listed. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I just yeah. have one question. Libby, do you know what the Vermont Student Privacy Alliance is? <coughs> is that a question for Mike Berry? It's, it's a statewide piece that uh, it's like a conglomeration that that does some work for us to just become a member and then they do some of the privacy screenings of different softwares and we can look up software or um, programs for kids online and check to see if they sell student data or not. Oh, okay. okay. It, it just does, it just does work for us. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then I also just wanted to say in that same policy, I really appreciate both the emphasis in the policy on digital citizenship and in the how much it's playing out in our schools um, by way the um, I can see it as a parent in the what my kids talk about when they come home and then I could also see it show up in Mike's report. So I just want to say I think that's really critical. It's probably one of the most important things our kids need in order to be able to have be a, a human being in the world once they leave our um, the walls of our schools. Excellent. Um, any other questions or discussion about the policy monitoring reports? Uh, all those in favor of approving them? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Also, my reports pass. Um, motion to adjourn. Do you want to do it, Jake? Second it. No, you can make the motion. You, you can make it. Yeah. Uh, motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thanks, everyone.